Hey everybody, this is Bill from Music School Central and welcome to this video today. Today is actually a very special video. I rarely ever share information about my own history when it can't, comes to music, music schools, etc. So I thought this would be a great time to talk to you about my own journey when I applied to colleges for music. And I was accepted to my top choi two choice schools, which were Michigan and Northwestern. I think this story is very relevant for a few reasons. One, I wasn't your best typical student, right? I wasn't the kid with the perfect SAT, the perfect 4.0 GPA, uh, who had won all these awards from, you know, all over the place. That actually wasn't my, my profile, which is kind of the profile of a typical student accepted to a school like Northwestern, which is a top 10 school by US News this year. I was a good student, but I wasn't a great student. However, I still found myself accepted to these two exceptional schools. And I think the reason, or maybe I should say, really, I know the reason, is because of all the things that I did on the music side to get me accepted, to get me prepared for admission into these programs. So I'm gonna share with you the do's and don'ts of my own journey that I learned when I applied to music school many years ago. So two things before we start this video. The first is, is that there are now new spots open in my one-on-one -on -one college consulting program. So stick around to the end of the video and I'll tell you more about that and we can see if you would be a good fit to get involved in that. The second thing is that uh, this is actually my second YouTube video ever. And if you like this content, please subscribe, comment, uh, like, smash the likes. And if enough people like this, I'll continue to make more YouTube videos and maybe we'll make YouTube a, a regular part of the Music School Central experience, right? Maybe I'll just make it a regular thing. So with that being said, let's talk about my own story as well as seven do's and don'ts that I learned from my journey applying to music schools. So to give you some background, I was applying to music schools in 2006 and back then college consultants weren't really around so I didn't have a college consultant to guide me at the time. I had to do a ton of research to figure out how to get accepted and what were the right steps for me to get into these programs but despite the fact that I wasn't your straight A student or that perfect SAT uh, or ACT score uh, student. So here is the first thing I learned uh, and that was one of my big takeaways. And that's that you want to be unique, but not too out of the box. So in my own story, I applied to schools for composition. And I wrote this very unique piece of music that combined 12-tone music, which is a style of contemporary classical music, it's called 12-tone music, and classical minimalist music. And I combined it into one piece. I combined these two very different genres into one piece of music. And when I went to different schools and I had my interviews with composition faculty, they all made a comment about it. They all said, oh, this is very unique. We've never heard anything like this before. Tell us more about this. Whether they liked the music or not was actually less relevant than how unique the piece was and what my intentional approach to that piece of music was. What I liked about that piece was that I was using two styles of classical music, so it was within bounds. It was classical music I was writing, but it was unique. It was positioned differently. Now, had I gone into that interview and written a piece with lots of rap and hip hop, it probably would not have worked out so well because that would have been out of bounds. That would have been too unique. That wouldn't have been within the idiomatic uh, genre of contemporary classical music. However, 12-tone music and minimalism are accepted genres of contemporary classical music. So by combining these two, I was able to position myself in a very unique way. Now look, if you're a composer, I'm not telling you to go write a 12-tone minimalist piece, but what I am saying is that whether you're a composer or any musician, finding a way to stand out in this process from other applicants 
and not be just that you're a regular vanilla student is really key when you're applying for these schools. So that's my first do, and now I'm gonna to go to my next don't. I'm gonna look at my notes real quick. Oh uh, yeah, so this was so relevant to me, and I see this with so many of my students now. Don't play repertoire only because you think it's impressive. So I'll never forget, I was accepted to Michigan and Northwestern, but I was not accepted to every school I applied to. One of the schools I did not get accepted into was Indiana University. Now, IU was not one of my personal top two choice schools, so I was kind of okay with the fact I didn't get in. But what I learned from my experience applying to IU was that when I applied, I auditioned on a, with a piece, even though as a composer, you still have to do piano auditions sometimes. I auditioned with a piece that I could just never play very well. It just wasn't under my fingers. I had about four pieces in my repertoire and three I just nailed. I could play super well. But this one piece I could just never quite get under my fingers. And I'll never forget when I got my rejection letter from IU and I emailed IU and I said, what's going on? Why wasn't I accepted? And they said, compositionally, we wanted you. It was your piano audition that kept you from getting accepted to our school. Funny enough, for Northwestern and for Michigan, I did not play that same piece. I played the other pieces I was, I was already good at for my auditions, and I ended up getting accepted into both of those schools. So don't play repertoire only because you think it's impressive. Play repertoire because you love it, you want to play it, you've been practicing it, and you just play it really well. So that's my one of my don'ts. Now I'm gonna go to a do. A do is plan out your summer programs and any other important activities like competitions. So the summer before my senior year, I enrolled at the Tanglewood Institute, which is a program from Boston University, and it is widely considered one of the three or four best summer programs for classical students. Now, it's, not neither, it's neither necessary nor sufficient to go to a summer program when you are enrolling into colleges, right? To get, I mean, to get ready to enroll into colleges. It's not by itself gonna get you in, but at the same time, a going to a summer program can be a very valuable experience with lots of summer instruction uh, that you may not get in your yearly lessons, right? I found it to be incredibly valuable uh, for myself and students of mine who've gone to Tanglewood have found it to be incredibly valuable as well. I then applied to a competition my senior year, and I recommend you apply to the same competition. I'm not a huge fan of competitions, but this particular one is well recognized by universities when it comes to undergraduate uh, music admissions, and it's called Young Arts. So Young Arts is this great competition, and you don't even have to place a top award to be recognized by schools. I didn't get a top award at Young Arts, but I got an honorable mention and all of a sudden, a week after I got that honorable mention, a school I didn't even apply to accepted me into their program and gave me a scholarship. I didn't go to that school, and I won't mention which school it is today, but it was a good school. It is a school that I would consider a top 20, 25 music school in the country. And that's because Young Arts is a very well-recognized competition. Look, if you don't place in Young Arts, it's not really a big deal. I've had plenty of students get into the top schools without doing Young Arts or even summer programs for that matter. But those things can be very helpful, summer programs and competitions, specifically the Young Arts one. Now I'm gonna go to a don't. And a don't is, okay, this one I really wish I had somebody to help me when I was applying to colleges because this is a big one. And I see this a lot in, from with my own students when they practice their interviews with me. And I have to correct them so they don't actually make this mistake in their real college interviews. Don't say something that's gonna work against you for your admissions chances. I'll never forget in my own story, I was interviewing for University of Michigan, which is my alma mater, that is where I ended up going. And one of the faculty members I was interviewing, his name is Eric Santos. And Eric is this really interesting, really good composer who writes an amalgamation of classical music and pop music into one genre. That's his niche, that's just what he does. And I was uh, interviewing with Eric and with some other faculty members, and I'll never forget, I was 
asked about my musical aesthetic and I said something like, oh, I don't like it when composers mix classical music and pop music, which is like the worst thing to say in front of somebody who's made it their life mission to write music that combines classical and pop music. It was very offensive, right? And it wasn't well researched. Now look, Eric is a really cool guy. And I talked to him about it years later once I was at the school and there was, there was absolutely no tension at all. I mean, he was super cool about it, right? But Eric is the exception. Not, you can't expect every faculty member to be just super cool if you say something like that in front of them. Uh, so you want to say, you don't want to say something that's going to jeopardize your admissions chances. You want to go into your interviews prepared and know what you want to say uh, beforehand and be prepared for the kinds of questions they're going to ask you in a music school interview. So that was a don't. Now we're going to go back to a do. And a do, speaking of faculty, is you want to meet faculty ahead of time. I talked about this in my last video too. It's worth mentioning again because it was part of my own story. When I was looking into colleges for music, I met with the chair of the Northwestern University program during my college search process. And his name at the time was Lee Hyla. Lee was a great composer. He died a few years ago, rest in peace Lee. An amazing person as well. And it was one of the best conversations of my life. I sat down with him for an hour. We reviewed my music and we just had a really nice discussion about music. Now remember, I wasn't the kid with the perfect SATs. I wasn't the kid with the straight A grades. I wasn't the kid with uh, all these amazing extracurricular activities outside of music, right? And then what did happen though, was a few weeks after meeting with Lee Hyla, I was accepted into Northwestern. And I still kind of can't believe it in a way because it is a top 10 university, but it was because of all the music things I did. The meeting with Lee Hyla, the summer programs, the young arts competition, and then lots of other things I did as well that are beyond the scope of this video, right? So it can be very strategic to meet faculty ahead of time. I said this in my last video, I'll say it again today. It's not a guarantee that you're gonna get accepted if you meet faculty ahead of time, but it can be beneficial for you in this process. And they're called trial lessons. They're, they are uh, a well-established practice when it comes to meeting faculty at music schools. So that was a do. And now my next don't is don't practice repertoire less than six months in advance of your pre-screen recordings. This is especially true for classical musicians. It's a little bit less true for jazz musicians because an advanced jazz player can pick up a jazz standard that they've never played before in a week and probably play it quite well because if you're a jazz player, you just know jazz is different. But for classical music, there's so many things to consider when executing a piece of music properly. There's getting the right articulations, dynamics, phrasing, interpretation, and then of course just getting the notes and rhythms in the right place as well is super important. So it really takes quite a long time to master all of these elements. All of the pieces in my repertoire that I played for auditions, I had been playing them all for at least a year, except that one piece that I was telling you about earlier that I could just never get under my fingers. Part of it was I started it just a few months before my auditions. That wasn't the right move on my end. And now I have taught this to my own students and they've learned from my mistake and have done very well when it comes to auditioning for colleges for music, right? So you wanna make sure that when you are auditioning for schools, you practice the repertoire for your auditions at least six months in advance, especially if you're a classical musician. And then my final do from my own story is understand the history of your instrument and genre. So when I was in that meeting with Lee Hyla, he was asking me questions like, oh, who were your biggest musical influences? And I said to him, well, on the 12-tone side, I like Arnold Schoenberg and Milton Babbitt. And on the minimalist side, I like Reich, Adams, and Glass. And then I talked to him about what I liked about them. And he could tell that I was legit, right? That I was somebody who was credible and knew what I was talking about. 
And now that I'm in the position of helping students get accepted, I can tell you I see this all the time. The students who really know their instrument or their genre, the history of it, the practice of it, the lore of it all, they always do the best in this process. And it's because practicing can take you so far, but education about the history of music is gonna give you that extra mile. It's gonna give you that extra advantage over other students who are applying, who may be perfectly good musicians, but are just not as deeply educated and passionate about the history of music as you can be. So one of the best investments of your time can be to really learn about the history and the lore of what you want to do in college because it can pay dividends when it comes to admissions and possibly even scholarships as well. But signs that in the greater picture of things, it, it just sh shows that you care, right? Faculty want to see that you care about the thing that you do, that you really love what you're doing. Understanding the history of it and being able to talk intelligently about it is an easy way for them to figure out who is good and who could use more time looking into the history of music. So I hope you found that video interesting and my story interesting. To tell you the sort of summary of it all, I was accepted to Michigan and Northwestern and those were my top two schools and I was really trying to decide which one. I got a scholarship to Michigan and at the same time, Michigan's uh, listed tuition price was already a lot less than Northwestern's. So it was a kind of hard decision for me, to be honest, because I really liked both schools. But over the course of four years, my family was going to save about $100,000 by choosing Michigan over Northwestern. So I chose Michigan at the end. I don't regret it. I think it was the right choice for me. I think it was the best school for me personally. Northwestern is an amazing school, though. I'm sure I would have had an equally good education at Northwestern as well. For my family, it just came down to the finances. And I see that a lot with my own students. There's two, you may get accepted into uh, two schools and one gives you a pretty good financial offer. One gives you an amazing financial offer. And in your mind, they're about equal. You usually are gonna pick the school with the better financial offer, right? So that happened to me. And I see that all the time with my students now. So if you are still watching this at this part of the video, then I invite you to book a one-on-one -on -one call with me. So we have new spaces open in our college consulting program. You may have seen, if you came to my website as recently as May, a waiting list that was actually on my website. We were so busy that we had to wait for our seniors to graduate before we could take on any more students. The waiting list is open now, and we are taking new students into the program for a short amount of time. So if you are interested in getting one-on-one -on -one guidance for helping you get accepted into the best college for you for music, then you can book a free call with me. I'm gonna leave a link in the description and you can book the call with me there. Finally, this was my second YouTube video ever. So if you did like this kind of content, please subscribe, please like, leave a comment, uh, engage with the video. And that'll tell me that you really like this and if enough people like it, uh, we'll make YouTube into a regular thing and I'll tell more stories about how to get accepted, tips for admissions, scholarships, etc. Right? So thanks for joining me on this video today and you'll be hearing from me soon.